Now, the lower two cannon received low rainfall, uh, probably about 10 inches, and it's in the path of the mighty Missoula floods, which were biblical in magnitude. And not only did they create, you know, detrimental scab lands, they also created deep polluted soils, good for farming, and left some natural beauty as well, like Palouse Falls, which is a 200-foot falls, uh, the tallest in the area. And the, the uniqueness of why I have this in, in the presentation is I did have a wager with Andre, my COTR, and the head of fisheries. And I said, if I don't get this project done, we talked about cutting it in half, um, the scope of it. I said, I will go over Palouse Falls in a Bernier beer keg and you can film it and put it on YouTube. So I was really pressured to get this project done. Unfortunately though, me and my wife took a walk below Palouse Falls a few weeks after that bold claim, and this poor beaver went over the falls, and I've concluded it wouldn't have been an enjoyable experience, and, and judging by the digits here, that's a defiant beaver. Okay, this is a follow-up to the film we showed, which talked about the 2005-2006 fires, which created catastrophic um, damage in the upper two cannon. There was 150,000 acres burned, and it occurred in the upper um, hill slopes as well as deep into the riparian. It also physically burned wood out of the river, and we had a fish kill on a main tributary of the two cannon. It killed fish in a two mile stretch from what I understand. So show this video please, Scott. These upper hills were mature conifers and they're very barren from the fire. But the bed form really suffered too. So our restoration efforts will focus on regaining some of the complexity that should be in existence in the upper two cannon. Now here's uh, a practice that occurred up by Camp Wooten in the, in the 60s, flood control, and it was done in such a damaging fashion where they took heavy equipment and literally gutted the river from the inside out to make push-up berms. So that is simplifying the channel form. It's cleaning it out, but so now we're in charge of kind of reversing this trend. And an aerial photo really illustrates what I mean by simplification. You know, historically we had very complex braided channels, secondary channels, healthy riparian. And then when you go in and do simplification or flood control, you diminish the complexity of the system and make it inefficient. We're basically pushing water out as fast as we can shortest distance between two points is a straight line. We're actually whisking water away, which isn't beneficial to the community. So with fires and simplification, you actually reduce your natural recruitment complexity. And what I mean by that is uh, there's not as healthy of riparian growth, and if it does fall into the river, since the channel's straight, there's nothing for it to hang up on. It's like you see at the mouth of the Walla Walla. There's a peninsula out there now where all the wood is whisked away downstream. So we made a, a tactical choice to artificially supplement what we were lacking in large woody debris. So here's a video showing supplementation via air. So that's the method we chose because we didn't want to damage the riparian further. And since helicoptering is the most dangerous type of work out there, you've got to be conscious of safety. And that's why you always got to wear your helmet, whatever type you may choose, or in this case, a, an energy dome, and keep your head on a swivel. 
So our source of trees, um, thank you to Del Grote from the Forest Service and Steve Radabaugh, private landowner. We got a good mix of live timber that we thinned off a private parcel, and we got windblown trees at minimal cost from the Forest Service. So green trees and deadwood trees. Now, green trees have a lot more complexity to them. They have more weight to them. The branching is more functional in terms of um, helping river process. So we use a lot of the green trees over the top of the plain, like, telephone pole-looking trees. I think the natural aesthetics of it make the, the river look a lot, you know, better. So the project details. We um, restored two miles of the upper two cannon, and it butts up against the wilderness, so we worked as high up in the basin as we could. Um, we prioritized this area based on a geomorphic assessment. So we put 825 trees and 500 boulders into the channel. And unfortunately, the toucan has only one staff, so I had to rely on a lot of partners. I see familiar faces out here, and I really appreciated your assistance. Now, the objectives were clear. Um, habitat complexity was by far the most important, uh, and that was the target. Secondary was floodplain connectivity. And thirdly, and more distant, was getting fish passage back into compliance with state criteria. So does anybody you know, know how much it would cost with all the past hasteful decisions and sins of, of, of harming the river with heavy equipment, how much it costs us to try to get it back to approach historical condition? Because you usually don't get historical condition. It's more feasible to preserve things if you have to go back and try to fix it. Anybody have an idea how much that might cost to fix two miles? One million dollars. Well, there you go. <laughs> so primary objective is complexity. This really illustrates complexity from an aerial view, a still shot from a drone. What I mean by complexity is this gauntlet of trees. Now that more resembles the pre-disturbance condition I showed in the black and whites. We're trying to mimic, uh, which is biomimicry, we're mimicking natural conditions and trying to make it look authentic. And these are the private um, source of trees from the private landowner that make it look authentic. But I want to stress that um, the tribe has a natural riverine process of restoration um, through the river vision. And we don't like to use a, like a cookie cutter approach of this particular log configuration is going to be used at nine different sites. Because you never see an identical um, log configuration in a natural system. They're all different at each site. So once you get on the ground, you can see how different each one of these is. It's site-specific remedies. I think this really illustrates the value of the trees from Mr. Radabaugh because uh, they catch fine substrates. Juvenile fish can hide in there. It looks authentic like a tree just tipped over. Now other um, on the ground looks at complexity configurations show a great variety of techniques used. I like to make each one unique. Oh, <laughs> we had a... Uh, situation where this particular 40 inch dbh that's a big ponderosa pine was too heavy for the helicopter and it was in an area that was very very dangerous so we incorporated a ground implementation strategy as well The reason those guys are celebrating is because we, we had a deal. We broke two chains before that, and we, th we thought, this is our third try. If we fail on this, then we're probably not going to keep wasting time and money. So we're really happy to get that tree in the river. We also had a 13-foot rock that was actually underneath that tree when the tree was still alive and growing, and the rock collapsed. It was way too big to move with one machine, so we ended up doing a dual team approach here with two excavators. Now this rock was on the bank, 
And so we were just clamshell rolling it over because we couldn't pull it. So we had to roll it over and put it as an island in the middle of the channel. All right, so we, we got the tree down, um, but it's not in the water. The boulder's now in the water, so we're going to combine the two and, and make and convert a riffle to a series of straight scour pools or lateral scour pools. So the finished product looks pretty good and it's very unique. So objective two, uh, more of a secondary objective, but well within the, the tribe's river vision, you want to reconnect um, and get sub-irrigation back to grow riparian attributes. Um, so we concentrated on um, constructing braids to get a connection of surface water between these two, the primary braid and the secondary braid. We even made a tertiary. But you get underground movement through hyperreic flow through these particular gravel bars, and it cools the water. And I like to choose, um, you know, taking old aerial pictures and looking at where historic remnant braids, archaic braids, were located, so we don't have to be heavy handed in creating artificial braids. We're just re watering up braids that haven't been activated for years. So you get instant um, gratification because. Uh, they're inhabitable by fish right away, and you have good riparian attributes. Of our 1,242 additional meters of wetted channel habitat, the bulk of it is constituted in five braids that we've created. And fortunately, all of the five braids have excellent physical habitat metrics instantly established due to having good riparian. And all we had to do was just add water. So this is ready for fish to inhabit right away. We also had a good pulse of flow a couple months after we completed the project. And so we had some sheet water, which was going to spread across the floodplain, which hadn't been in contact with water in about 20 years. So we were ha really happy to see that. Here's a very effective way to make a, a braid come off of the main stem using a real strong engineered log jam and then a version of an apex island jam with most of the flow of the river about 75%, 80% going right down the middle between those two and then a couple deflector boulders in the middle of the creek. We cut a channel in here with an excavator, made a nice wishbone. So we only had to do a little bit of excavating at the head end to, to encourage water to go into these braids, and the rest of it was undisturbed. So we had over a thousand meters of undisturbed braiding. Now our third objective was to get these step heights within compliance of state criteria of 9.6 inches or less. We needed to decrease the the jump for fish. This was a cross vein used to um, help with the infrastructure of the bridge to prevent down cutting and, it, and we couldn't remove it because they have a water gauge there so we had to come up with a, a different strategy on how to rectify this so we chose a roughened channel over half of the wetted channel width and we were successful in getting rid of the step. Now a look from the bridge, this is before and after, shows we really reduced the um, amount of white water, uh, but we retained a nice scour pool here. Fish can just walk up this now, there's no step, so that was successful as well. But we wanted to um, also increase complexity, so we put in some enormous root wads and some big boulders to convert a riffle to riffle with pockets, which is more productive for fish. In our studies, we get a 20% increase in <laughs> fish inhabitants of riffle with pockets. And this is the most visible part of our project, right off a bridge. So we wanted to make a statement and show people that, you know, we're using salmon do dollars responsibly, and we wanted people to look over and say, you know, wow, that really looks like a typical western salmon river. 
So this is a before and after. This is treated, which means wood was added to this section right here. And then soon after, it'll show untreated and how plain the bed form was. Very stark in contrast to the pre-treatment condition. So with physical habitat improvement, you're also targeting biological response. And this particular short video shows um, how our, uh, a limited number of salmon which came up the toucan and utilized our structures right away. Here's a couple of root wads we've placed to create a better scour pool. And this springer's taken advantage of the sorting of the gravel adjacent to it in the good hiding cover. And it's digging a red right now. This is really successful because here's another springer. Good to see. So results, the most important things, we, we um, improve connectivity of the floodplain by building five new braided or secondary channels over 1,200 meters. We increased the number of pools by over 100 in that two mile restoration reach, which was a significant number of, of pools increased. Um, our complexity uh, measure, uh, which is we doubled the habitat units in the same amount of area post-treatment as that, at what, what were the, was there before. So we doubled the complexity. Overhead cover and um, undercut improved significantly. Our wood complexity index went way up, which is a value you place on importance to fish as habitat. And really striking was almost a triple, triple, tripling of the river complexity index, which is a function of sinuosity and number of secondary channels. So that was a dramatic increase. Now, what was good about this project is it went really smooth. And you can play this, Scott. And absolutely nothing went wrong the whole time. Um, didn't lose any sleep. Everything functioned well. No gray hairs whatsoever. It was just smooth from start to finish. Well, not really. I mean, because Scott did, did end up crashing the drone. Oh, that's right. We did also have uh, several minutes before the helicopters were coming in. Despite repeated requests for the public to stay out of the area, and we actually had it flagged off with do not enter tape, this is what we walked into right before the first delivery. This is what we walked into a half an hour before flight time. Surprise, 50 yards from where we're going to set our first logs. It's a free for all. Now that was up at Camp Wooten and I, I couldn't believe how, how uh, uncooperative the, the gentleman on the, uh, who was in charge of uh, supervising these kids were. I asked him to please get off the water and he said, you know, this is a public waterway and we're, I'm like, well, that's okay, but in, in a few minutes, you're gonna have 8,000 pounds of trees coming over you and land in about 50 yards from you. Then he, then he got out of there. So easily the most difficult part of this, took about a year, year and a half, was permitting. And um, it was about a Portland phone book of permitting. And one in particular, the JARPA permit is a conglomerate of several permits, like parts A through E. That was really um, difficult to, to navigate through. Here's just an example of attachment A, and there are several more attachments. Um, so I, I was really having a hard time with this, getting it through, so I actually wanted to go sit down and talk to the permit entities to get uh, you know, a short description of what I could do to make this you know, beneficial to everybody and get it passed through. So. I'm in the brown shirt on this video where I actually recorded it so I could study it later, so I could go back to it and successfully permit this. And the permit supervisor is in the white shirt trying to explain to me attachment A. <laughs> Again, Hunt. This is the uppercase A. Ah, the upper. Case A. <laughs> I got that. All right. Whoa. <laughs>
And this is the lower case A. The lower case A. <laughs> Oh, God. Oh. Ugh. Oh, God. And... Okay. And... and this is the upper... Enough! Do you want my head to explode? In the name of all that is good and decent! No more for today! Thank you to Tom Sherm for explaining things and sorry to Bruce and Dave for maybe overreacting a time or two. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> any questions for Eric? Loved it. Yeah. Highly recommended. Super efficient helicopter. Um, less wind turbulence than the Ericsson we used before. I love the Bertal. It's real quick. Um, I'm looking forward to maybe using a Chinook in a few years, which has twice the capacity, but the Bertal is my favorite machine by far. It's far superior to the Sky Crane, in my opinion. I would really seek that, Dave. Um, I just was down in California and talked to an individual who used um, the Ericsson craft, and he had a little bit of issue with it as well. The Vertol 107 is just a lot more smooth and quick and efficient, and I don't think the, the load ratings are that different. I mean, I know they're supposed to be. Um, I love that Vertol 107. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we had 100 degree temperatures too, so that kind of decreased our weight load. Um, but it still carried 9,000 pounds easily. It's my understanding that it did, but I see the authority figure back there, Dell, with crossed arms, and that might not be a good sign. Is it working, Dell? Good. Anything else for Eric? Hey, we're real quick. Dell's going to retire soon, and I really appreciated him helping us out. He was the best partner I ever had. I appreciate that.